So we're into our second Sunday of 2018, praise God. We're all alive and kicking. Mostly healthy. But definitely happy. Yeah, yeah it, it's, um, it's a funny thing for me because, um, I don't know, I love Sundays. You know, and, and I guess that's just the preacher in me. Um, so it's like getting getting from Sunday to Sunday. You know, people like some people get from Friday to Friday or Saturdays. I get from Sunday to Sunday. You know, this is like um, uh, it's it's just my my special time because I guess I get to do what I what I really really love to do. And and this and nothing there's nothing that gives me greater joy than to be able to share the liberating truth of God's unconditional love and unlimited grace. Amen. Amen. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this day. Thank you for your word. Let it go forth with boldness, simplicity, and power. Let it minister grace to our hearing, Lord, and, and lift us up and encourage us and edify us in such a way that we're able to take this word and share it with others, that others may be blessed and come and know you as well. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> What is the phrase that every believer wants to hear someday? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Everybody wants to hear that. Everybody wants to believe that they've met the requirement. To enter into the presence of God. That seems to be the goal, the end game of most Christians. Likewise, there is another phrase that people don't want to hear, that it brings them great fear and trepidation, and that is depart from me. You worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. Nobody wants to be a worker of iniquity. And nobody, nobody in faith, and I'll submit to you that even those who don't know God, at some point in their life, I, I believe that they hope that they will not hear that when they cross from time into eternity. To part from me. That's harsh. That's harsh. That you know that is essentially saying get out of my face. And then on top of that to say that I never knew you. That you've been doing kingdom work, you've been going to church, you've been praying, you've been doing all the right things, and, and you find yourself in this spot where the Lord says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I'm going to interrupt your regularly scheduled message of condemnation with a message of unspeakable joy. I'm going to interrupt your message of fear with a message of hope. And I pray that at the end of what I say today, that it encourages you to walk in a new level of hope. Because I'm here to tell you that the whole thing about depart from me, you worker of iniquity, has been taught wrong. You heard it wrong. And so by the grace of God, I hope to clarify this for you in such a way that you will walk in a level of freedom 
that you've never walked in before. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And this is Jesus speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, let me set this up with another incident in the life of Jesus. His disciples come running to him saying, Lord, there are people who are not with us that are doing things in your name. And Jesus told them, forbid them not, because if they are not against us, they're for us. This, would, this creates a contradiction because here Jesus is saying, the, the, these people said, hey, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons? Well, these people, these other people were, were ca casting out demons and they were prophesying. They were healing in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, forbid them not. So obviously we're not talking about the same type of people or the same class of people, the same groups of people. This has to be something different. And one of the things we talk about this here at Agape Dominion, why context is so important. Because text without context is just a con. Or as we say in preaching circles that text without context is a pretext to a proof text. And a proof text is when you take the text and try to make it say what you want it to say. You try to make it say what you want, whatever it is that you want to justify. So here we have a, an issue of context. Who is Jesus talking to? Well, there's another thing in preaching circles, we call it the 2020 rule, that if you take a, a specific passage of scripture, you need to go back 20 verses and ahead 20 verses to understand the context of that particular passage of scripture. Now, you know, you could make the case for the 2020 rule, but in this case, it applies, and I'll tell you why. Because in this passage of scripture, Jesus is coming to the close of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is very interesting. Because the Sermon on the Mount doesn't talk about behavior. It doesn't talk about wickedness. It doesn't talk about sin. What it has to do with is how do we love people? The Sermon on the Mount is a message of love. And it's showing you why the, law, why the law cannot fulfill the law of love. So here we have something deep here because you have... Jesus saying people that prophesied and cast out demons in his name but then you have another passage of scripture where, where, Jesus, where, where people are casting out demons and Jesus says forbid them not. So obviously Jesus had a target that he was directing this particular passage of scripture at. And if you go back to the first verse of Matthew chapter 7, you'll find that Jesus is saying, judge not 
lest ye be judged. Now I humbly submit to you that someone who is self-secure has no need to judge. They have no need to judge because in, in their security, they have no need to compare themselves to others. See, this is the problem with the law and, and religion is that the law and religion gives people a license to put together a sin scorecard. In other words, it gives you a yardstick by which you can measure the sins of others against your own actions and behavior. And when you have a sin scorecard, if you are trying to do all the right things, if you're focused on doing, if you're focused on your actions, if you're focused on your behavior, then it gives you a tool by which you can look down on others because they either sin more than you, sin differently than you, or sin more sinfully than you. But at the end of the day, what it is, is a yardstick, a measuring tool. But Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. Here's the deal, and this is going to help you find the context where you'll find the, the target audience. Because there was one group of folks that liked to judge. As a matter of fact, they judged Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. They called him a sinner. They called him a whoremonger. They called him a drunkard. These are the things that, let me tell you this about that. That nobody can accuse you of something that they haven't seen you in the midst of. No one can call you a whoremonger unless you're in the company of prostitutes. No one can call you a drunkard if you're not in the company of drunks. Nobody can call you a crackhead if you're not hanging out with crackheads. So for Jesus to have been accused of these things, he had to have been running with some of these folks. See, here's Jesus walking around on the one hand, talking about righteousness and talking about how people are not loving and people are not giving and people are, are, are mistreating others. But here he is, turn the water into wine, hanging out with the drunks. A prostitute breaks a, vi a, a vial of costly ointment and anoints his feet with it. And he didn't check her on that. See, Jesus was, was, a, a, he was considered to be a rabbi. So he had on priestly robes and for a prostitute to have even touched him was worthy of death. And he didn't check her on that. Matter of fact, while I'm here, let me hang my hat on this, is that if you go through the Gospels, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from the beginning of the Gospels to the end of the Gospels, you will never, ever, 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 ever find Jesus checking somebody on their sin. Not once. He didn't tell the, he didn't tell the drunkard to get sober. Didn't tell the, 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 the prostitute, get right. Didn't tell the tax collector to change his ways. Didn't tell. Matter of fact, Zacchaeus was hanging out in a tree because he was a little guy. He couldn't see Jesus over the crowd because he wasn't tall enough. So he climbed up in a tree and, and, and Zacchaeus proceeded to try to tell Jesus how I took from people, but I gave it back. And he was trying to tell Jesus how he tried to make everything right. Jesus stopped him in his tracks and said, I must dine with you. 
He didn't tell the tax collector how crooked he was. Didn't tell him how sinful he was. The only people who Jesus had a rebuke for were the religious leaders. That's church folk if, if, any, if, if ain't nobody caught that. That's the preacher, the deacon, the church mother. You know, the ones that, well, baby, you know you ought not have worn that to church. A oh, baby boy, you know you, you, you shouldn't wear earrings into the house of God. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, sister, brother, you know, y'all shouldn't be trying to sit on the front row of the church. You know y'all shacking up. Judge not, lest ye be judged. See, it's only the people who have the sin scorecard who are trying to judge anybody. So this is who Jesus is talking to. So Jesus is saying we're to do the will of the Father. Y'all, For y'all that they, they, they get to sit here every Sunday, this is an easy one for y'all. Because doing the will of the Father is real simple. Everybody say love. Love. Because this is the only thing that Jesus said by which we, anyone would know that you're his disciples. That you have love one for another. In other words, Jesus isn't concerned about whether you... Uh, whether you cuss or smoke or or it, he's not concerned about whether you looking out the, you giving the side eye to the cutie ne uh, next to you he's not worried about that and I'm not saying that any of that stuff is okay That's, uh, li listen here's here's the thing anything that you do if you don't do it to your own ruin I'm, a, I'm here to tell you is okay if you don't do it to your own detriment and to the detriment of others it's okay it's okay. I'm here to tell you that. And a lot of people aren't going to like that because they're going to say, oh, well, you're being soft on sin. No, you know, you're, anybody that tells me I'm being soft on sin, I say, you're being hard on grace. Or, let me put it another way, that you seem to think that your petty little sin has more effect than the blood of Jesus and his finished work. I'm just saying. So, so here's the thing. You know, love is the straight gate. You know, Jesus said, enter in through the straight gate. He said, for broad is the way to destruction. In other words, let me tell you something. See, this love, this love thing is not easy. If, you know, it's simple, but it's not easy easy. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if you think about it, I'm saying that everybody in this room, everybody that's watching, everybody has somebody that you just really don't like. I mean, it's this one person that gets under your skin. It's this one person who is like Paul's thorn to you. They are the messenger of Satan sent to buffet you. You know who they are. I ain't got to tell you because you got them. And if you tell me you don't, you're lying. Every single soul walking the earth has that person. And for some people, it's people. For some people, it's hordes. It's a lot of folks. It's easy for me to love Angela because that's my wife, my rib, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Easy for me to, to love my sons. Easy for me to love you guys. It's easy. Y'all good peeps. I like y'all. I don't like everybody. I'm going to keep it real in a hundred. I don't. And as nice a guy as you think I am, not everybody digs me. 
can't get under some folks' skin. I mean, listen, everybody has somebody. So if I love you who are easy to love, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything spectacular. I haven't done anything really significant. All I did was just kind of gratify my own flesh by loving who I love, loving who I like. But to love that person who was sent by Satan to buffet you, to love that person who has stolen from you, to love that person who has cheated you, to love that person who has cursed you, to love that person who has lied on you, that takes something. And look here, I'm going to tell you something. You can't love like that without Jesus. If you think you can, you're wrong. It takes Jesus to love the unlovable in your life. If you don't have him, well, you just might not. You, you, your, your discipleship is <laughs> suspect. I know that's harsh. I'm not going to say that you're not a disciple. I'm not going to say that you're not saved. But it's suspect. Here's the thing. The straight gate, the narrow way, is love. That's the hard way in. If you if you're not if you're not coming through love if you're not coming by the way of love you're not, you can't get in. That's what Jesus was talking about. Now I must say, nearly for believers, nearly impossible. And the reason why I say nearly is because without Jesus you can't do it. Jesus makes everything possible. It's like where, where we say impossible, he says I'm possible. Love. Love sacrifices its own desire. Love sacrifices its, its own desire. I, you know, um, before I got married, I used to indulge in a whole bunch of stuff. I'd buy, I don't know, maybe three, four cars a year. Dumb stuff. I had a Rolex watch. Dumb stuff. I had money and not much sense. I used to indulge myself. But now that I'm now that I'm, I'm I'm married and I have a family, I, I can't indulge myself like that. Not that I can't, but I don't. Because love says that I must sacrifice me for the greater good of them. Can you imagine? Put yourself in the shoes of Jesus for a minute. You're hanging on a cross, on a hill, naked before people. You've been judged, mocked, spit upon, beaten, and nailed to a couple of raggedy beams and hung out to dry. Can you imagine that? I don't know about you, but I'm speaking the real Derek. The real Derek would have been a little pissed off about that. I wouldn't have been too thrilled about that. I'd have been a little upset. I, I don't... 
listen, I don't know if I could have got to Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't know if I... I'll just be honest. I, I don't know if I could, it, you know, I, because see, I'm talking, I'm, I'm speaking to myself. I'm taking myself out of Jesus for the sake of this discussion outside of Christ. Could I, could I have done that? And, and matter of fact, even in Christ, I ain't gonna lie, that'd be hard. <clears throat> but Father, forgive them. If anybody had a case to judge someone, that would have been the moment. If anybody could have levied judgment, because Jesus said, I don't judge, but if I did, my judgment would be just. He said, I don't judge, but if I did, my judgment would be just. In other words, he, at that point, when he was hanging between humanity and divinity, he could have said, you know something, all of y'all guilty, dead, done. And just smoked everybody. Wave of his hand, everybody dead. But Father, forgive them. The level of love that that took, the level of love that it took for the Son of God to, to, to know the hearts of men and to, and to decide to come here anyway, knowing that his flesh would have to die. And not just die, but die a horrible death. You know, it's like we, we always talk about like, you know, you look at these videos of somebody clowning and they, and they have a, an epic accident, epic fail, right? And you say, oh, boy, that'll leave a mark. Oh, boy, that'll hurt. You know, we, we make jokes about it. But here it's like Jesus knew he was, you know, he was coming to, you know, the, the people were going to look at this and say, epic fail. And, and yet he came anyway. And yet he died anyway. And before he died, he forgave them anyway. I, I just can't wrap my mind around that. So here's the thing. Jesus said that many will come and they'll, and, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we heal? Did we cast out demons? Did we do all of these things? Watch this. Religion loves to look like Christ. Religion makes it its business to look like Christ. If I could put this in a natural term that you might understand is that aspartame does its best to act like sugar. But it's deadly. It does its best to, to convince you, hey, I'm sweet and I'm good. But it lies. It lies. It has a, a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. Religion is out here every Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. They put on a good show. And then they'll turn around and curse somebody. They'll put on a good show. But they'll ignore those in need. They'll put on a good show. But be content to leave people in pain and despair. See, but they're saying, Lord, Lord. But, but, but Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. See, religion comes in Sunday morning 
and see somebody sitting in their pew and says, you got to, you, you in my spot. See, I, I, I'm a tither. I, I, I was here when we built this. You in my spot. Never mind that that person may be in that spot because they're in a posture to receive something from God. Lord, Lord. I, it, but are they doing the work of the Father? And I said this before, that love, when you break love down into its elemental components, you have two things. You'll find two things at the root of love. Empathy and compassion. If I'm not willing to walk in your footsteps or see it through your eyes, see it through your perspective, experience it as you do, I don't love you. I don't care what I say. If I'm not willing to at least see it through your eyes and I say I love, I'm a liar. Compassion simply says I care and mean it. Not, hey, What's, you know, when people say, how are you doing? Sometimes I want to say, do you care? Do you care? I mean, really? I mean, how am I doing? Do you really want to know? Do you have time? See, the thing is, is that compassion says, I care. That, that not only do I want, do I want to hear what you have to say, but I want to sit down and I want to put my arm around you. I want to comfort you as you're going through it. If I have something encouraging and edifying to say, I will say it. But if I don't, I'll be silent and listen. That's compassion. And if I say that I love and I don't have compassion, then I'm a liar. See, there's a whole lot of lying going on. And I'm not saying that to be condemning. Don't y'all misunderstand. Because I love every human being. And I love every human being without judgment. I have no judgment to pass on any person. But institutions I do. Mm -hmm. I could talk about institutions. And I could talk about how filthy, corrupt, and, and rotten they are. And how they lie. And I don't have a problem with that. Because see, watch this. I got a model. See, Jesus <laughs> called these folks generation of vipers. You whitewashed tombs. You filthy cups. He called them thieves. He wasn't talking to the people. He's talking to their institutions. Because they let their institution supersede their humanity. And we can never make that mistake. Because see, if, if let, me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. And let, let me, Jesus is, Jesus is concerned about us individually. But he doesn't care about any of our institutions. If we stopped having church on Sunday, Jesus would still love each and every one of us. If we stopped going, he'd still love us. If you commit a crime, he still loves you. He still loves you. There is nothing, Paul wrote, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And when he says nothing, it means nothing. This is, Paul got this revelation directly from God. Nothing. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. So watch this. That if you're in Christ, you're in. Done deal. You're set. You know, and, and, and people say, oh, well, you believe that once saved, always saved? Well, yeah, I do. I don't believe that you can send your, your way out of salvation. I believe that that's impossible. Because if you can sin your way out of salvation, that means that there's a sin that you have that's greater than his finished work. The only thing that will separate any human being from the love of God is the rejection of Jesus Christ. The truth of Jesus Christ. 
Now I'm going to tell you, watch this. <clears throat> this is where, where grace comes in. Because there's a tide rising that's bringing the message, the truth of God's unconditional love and his unlimited grace to millions of people. I'm not the only voice. There are many who are preaching this. And this is the truth. There are a lot of people that haven't heard the truth. They sat in church all their lives and haven't heard it. Because they haven't heard that love is the way. They haven't heard that God, that, that God extends his grace, which is his unmerited favor and unlimited power toward you. They haven't heard that. So they, they've, they've heard about a Jesus, but they have not heard about the Jesus. And you have to believe that God has grace for people who have not heard him. See, it's like, I, I know people that call themselves atheists, and they, you know, and people say, well, they're going to hell because they rejected Jesus. Did they reject Jesus? Or did they reject your Jesus? See, see, here's the thing. Some people have a personal Jesus. And the personal Jesus is recreated in the image of man. The personal Jesus looks like you, thinks like you, acts like you. And he loves everything that you love and hates everything that you hate. That's the personal Jesus. But the real Jesus loves everybody, which means he loves some things that don't look like you, and he loves some things that don't act like you, and he loves some things that you don't think are right. See, the real Jesus loves unconditionally, and I can prove that scripturally. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, full stop. For God so loved the world, not the saints, not the Jews, not the chosen ones, not the elect. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love the world. Now, when, when Jesus says this, uh, in, in the King James it says iniquity. In the ESV it says lawlessness. And the legalist will say, see, 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 that, that's why we have to uphold the law. See, he said, you know, Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Yeah, see, see? That's not what he's saying. That's a gross misunderstanding, a gross misinterpretation. When he's talking about lawlessness, you have to go back to Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And that's this. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. He said on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. In other words the fulfillment of the law happens in love. Everything is in love. Everything is fulfilled by love. Everything is satisfied by love. Everything works by love. Faith works by love. Everything, everything that you will do in your life as a disciple, as a son or daughter of the king, every single thing hangs on love. There is nothing else that is more important. Nothing else that's more critical. Nothing else that's more germane to your walk in Christ than understanding love. Nothing. Not a single thing. So I'm going to tell you what lawlessness, what iniquity is. Failure to love. That's why Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. If you're busy judging, you're not busy loving. If you got time to judge, you won't have time to love. Because you're too busy trying to pick someone apart than to put them together. That's what workers of lawlessness are. 
It has nothing to do. See, see, people say, well, you know, it's those those dirty, rotten, low-down sinners. It's the ones that smoke. It's the ones that cuss. It's the ones that drink. And it's the ones that, that party. Those are the ones. Those are the workers of iniquity. And God is going to get you. God is not happy with you. God hates you. God's going to smite you. God's going to take away your kids. He's going to take away your house. He's going to take away your job. Be worker of iniquity. Ah, that's judgment. And see, here's the deal. Jesus is going to say, I don't know you because they didn't know him. See, that's why Jesus said you will know what the truth and what the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. See, this knowledge of the truth, this is not a casual acquaintance. This is like a husband and wife knowing each other. This is not my next door neighbor. Uh, this, is, this is like a parent and child. This is intimate knowledge of, not just a cursory understanding. And I even believe that for the worker of lawlessness, the unloving, that God has grace for them. God has grace for them. I don't believe that God is just sitting up in heaven waiting to even smite those guys. That's the thing, man. It's like I, I used to walk around in fear that because I said the wrong thing today, because I did the wrong thing today, because I had this negative thought, that, that God would say, depart from me, you worker of a nigga. Oh, I was like, and I was, I was in fear. Instead of running to God, I was running from God. Instead of trying to uh, lay myself bare before him, I'm trying to cover my shame. Because nobody wants to hear, depart, depart from me, you worker of a new... That, you know, it's like when I used to hear that and, and it just used to grate in my ears. But I'm here to tell you that God, if you are in Christ, you are okay. You don't ever have to worry about hearing that. See, and this is, religion has used this as a tool of manipulation and control and condemnation and judgment for centuries, telling people, you know, you don't want to hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You better get it right, baby boy. You better get it right, baby girl. You better stop sinning. You better stop drinking. You better stop fornicating. You better stop shacking because God is watching and boy, he's pissed. I want y'all to repeat some stuff after me. I want some audience participation. Mm -hmm. And those of you who are watching, you can participate too. I want everybody to participate. I'm gonna say some things and I want y'all to say them back. And if you don't, God's gonna get you. Just kidding. <laughs> I just had to wake y'all up. Here we go. Say, I am forgiven. I am, forgiven. I am clean. I am righteous. I am holy. I am healed. I am delivered. I am prospered. I am safe. I am secure. I am in Christ. That's you. That's the truth about you. That's the truth. And if you just said that, those who you are watching, if you just said that and you believe that in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, guess what? You just got saved. You, you, you didn't even know it. You were out here talk, just thinking you were repeating something after me. You just got saved. <laughs> Tricked you. <laughs> Can't get out now. <laughs> I didn't have my meds this morning. Y'all forgive me. Oh, you didn't hear about that? 
Watch this. When you are in Christ, you're in. There is no hokey pokey in the kingdom of God. I'm in. I'm in. I'm out. I'm in. There is none of that in the kingdom of God. If you're in, you're in. Done deal. Finished. And because you're in, you are a joint heir with him. That you are just like him. As Jesus is, so are we in this world, in this time. Right now. Done deal. And God said publicly to Jesus, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And guess what? You are in him. If God is pleased with him, that means God is pleased with you. And if God is pleased with him, he's never going to tell his son, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So guess what? You don't ever, 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 ever have to worry about God telling you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And anybody that tries to tell you that is proffering a lie from hell. You are in. Done deal. Full stop. End of story. You win. Amen? For anybody that's watching, just like I said, I said a minute ago, that you know, if you if you repeated those things with me and, and you believe that in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you're saved. And even if you didn't repeat those things, if you if you say, Hey, I heard something today that makes me think, hey, you know, I know that God loves me, I know that Jesus came and he died for me, that he rose from the dead, and I confess with my mouth that I believe in my heart that he died for me, and confess that he is the Lord of your life, then you are saved. Done deal. Done deal. So we're going to pray and then we're going to go ahead and um, and shut it down. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that has gone forth with boldness, simplicity, and power. Thank you that has ministered to our hearts and to our minds, Lord, and that has filled us up, up, filled us up in such a way that we're able to go out and share this with others. This too good to be true news of your unconditional love and your unlimited grace. And Lord, until we come back together and meet again, keep us safe, keep us blessed. And Lord, just thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you, and so do we.